I just pulled over because I came across this bridge abutment. At one time, this was a train bridge, but for my own curiosity's sake, I went up above and behind here. And I found something that I had no idea was back there. Something that's gonna require me to return and do a future visit to dig further into it and to see what else is hiding back there. I found it because today I'm on a journey with no destination, the destination's unknown. I'm riding a rail trail and I don't know where I'm gonna be stopping, how many miles I'm gonna be putting in, but I'm looking for things that are hiding along the way. And what's back there is requiring me to come back in the future because it's just too much to take in today. If you wanna see what's back there and to see what this journey's about with no destination, all you gotta do is come along with me. Before we get started, I wanna let you know that this video is serving two purposes. The first is to see what I might find along what is known as the D&H Rail Trail, the trail that I'm riding on for the very first time. I'm starting off here in Simpson, Pennsylvania, heading north, and I'm be going through some remote areas and hoping to find things that are hiding along the way. This trail is part of the Lackawanna River Heritage Trail, and they do have a map here, and we're starting right here, Simpson, and heading north, going through Forest City, Uniondale, Herrick, Arat, Thompson, depending on how far we go, because we don't know where we're gonna be stopping. That's the unique thing about today's adventure and journey, is that the destination's unknown. It could be any of these, could be in between, could be past that. The second reason and purpose of today's video is to see how this new e-bike performs by Anioki. This is the A8 Pro Max. It's an updated, upgraded version of the AQ177 that I reviewed and did a long distance video on earlier this year. And later on in the video, we will stop and talk more about it, learn all the specifications and features. And throughout my journey, I will share my thoughts on its performance. But now that's out of the way, let's head on out on our journey where the destination is unknown. And we're off. Our journey has begun. Now today while I'm riding, I'm gonna be doing a combination of pedaling and using throttle only, just to vary it up. And I am tracking my progress on the Relive app, which is running in the background on my phone. So we'll show the total progress, time duration, and a map of our journey. Got a horn. I got some covered hopper cars on the left-hand side here. And briefly looking ahead on the maps prior to coming here today to see what the trail looks like, I did spot a few things along the way in various towns. So I'm hoping I can find them. I think they are gonna be worthwhile checking out. And the tracks are right next to us here. And it looks like they dead end right here. Yeah, so those tracks dead end right there. It's a balmy 33 degrees out here in the middle of December. And it's supposed to get up to around 50 degrees, but not until this afternoon. So between now and then, it's gonna be a bit chilly, but I am prepared. I brought hand warmers. I got two pairs of gloves on, face mask, multiple layers. So, so far, not feeling too bad. Just pulled over and noticed, got an old mile marker here. There's a three. Looks like it could possibly be 37. Definitely a three. Looks like they kind of filled it in. That's in the old railroading days. And if, yes, if I didn't mention, we do have snow here. Certain parts of Pennsylvania have received snow. And since we're further north, it is lingering up here a bit longer. Thank you. 
I'm gonna make a pit stop here. There's a couple things I want to point out. I noticed. Looks like every so often they may have some designated pull-off picnic areas like this one, complete with picnic table, a place to lock up your bike, and trash receptacles, which is not often seen on the rail trails, especially what we did the Enola Rail Trail. No trash cans at all, so it's nice to see them here. So before the gated section. I am hearing some water and I think this is the place I'll be returning to in the warmer months because down here we not only have, I think that's a river, I'll double check and put that on the screen, I think that's maybe the Lackawanna River flowing down, but I did hear like a waterfall and there is indeed one, but it's not a natural waterfall. I do see water coming out of a culvert pipe, which means that may be something I could explore in the future as well. And on the other side, it does look leveled off. So the area, the landscape off the right hand side does drop down, but it does have some interesting features going on. And those of you who know me know that I love water and culverts and exploring. So pretty confident I will be back here in the future. And it's easy to find because it's basically right here at the first pull off picnic area from where we started. The other thing I want to mention too is one of the main reasons I'm doing this bike ride today, testing out this new bike, is I want to see... I'm looking, there's actually maybe a road over there. I see a, a sign. <laughs> that might be a road, whether it's a public road or an access road, I do see a road over there and a sign on a utility pole. Squirrel moment. I want to see how well this battery holds up. This bike is supposed to get the same range as the AQ177 Pro Max, which is a really long range. And on my long distance ride video on that bike, I did just under 80 miles and the battery barely went down. But that was under warmer days, good conditions. Being it's in the low 30s here, I'm wondering if that's going to eat away at the battery. So since my destination is unknown, I could be going anywhere from 15 miles to 35 miles. We don't know. So we're just going to see how, the th how things pan out. If the battery was to die, I do have a heavy bike to pedal back or to push. But we'll talk more about that later on. Let's continue down the trail. This bridge we're passing over is a former rail bridge that was renovated. Has a new bridge on it now, concrete deck, but still see the old stone abutments from where the bridge used to exist. Looking out to my sides too, I do see numerous old railroad ties. They were just discarded there when the rails were ripped up, but there is more than I could count laying here off the side of the woods. It looks like there are some other trails here too. There's a trail here with the red diamond on the left. Looks like there might be one up here on the right hand side, so there might be some more areas back here to explore in the future. Another former train bridge. And the water passes underneath us once again. This is actually a nice view of it. The little island right here, the water is coming around it, joins and comes underneath the bridge. Looks like it passes under the rail trail multiple times. Arms in, we made it. Oh, I see. It looks like an old abutment and a placard up here. Yes. Looks like an old rail line here, possibly. We're now at the base of a former rail bridge, which all that's left is an abutment and a snowy, icy plaque. Oh, we got a bridge. Okay, I'm sorry, a picture of a bridge. So 
So it says you are here, and this is what came across at one time. Uh, so the bridge abutment is part of the large span that crossed the DNH, the Delaware and Hudson Railroad, and the Lackawanna River. So I was right about that. The span was part of the northwest branch that connected the. Connected the O&W, New York, Ontario, and Western Railway on the east side of the river. The point where it joined the O&W was known as the Northwest Junction. Handy having a knife. There was a sequence of two bridges. Northwest Branch, number one, crossed the Lackawanna River. It was a deck truss bridge, 229 feet long, 15 feet high. Northwest Branch Bridge, number two, crossed over Jefferson Branch of the Erie Railroad, later D&H. It was a through lattice truss bridge, 120 feet long, 24 feet high. And there's some additional pictures here. Northwest branch led to many coal breakers on the west side of the river. Branch required a switchback to reach the upper levels of the hillside. Switchbacks are still evident today. A breaker was visible at the top right corner of the photo. Right up there. Close up, number, close up of number two bridge over the Erie. Wow, it's a pretty fascinating history. I didn't really look into it too much or understand what was involved here with the D&H, but it's a whole conjunction of different railroads, different lines. Some were servicing coal breakers and others were just transporting. What I want to do and what I'm going to do is actually get up on top of this abutment here, get some views of it and see if there's a line going that way. I know there's a line going that way, and I think in the future, whenever that may be, I'm gonna trace one of these old lines. I mean, we're basically tracing a line now on the DNH trail. It's essentially an old rail line. But those ones are more fascinating to me because I always wonder what's left? You know, do they rip up all the rails? Is there any ties, plates, spikes, any foundations from like signal towers? signal boxes, battery boxes, anything. So I'm just gonna be adding this to my list of things to explore in the coming future. But let's see what it, what it looks like up there and uh, get a better lay of the land. And here we are. There's my bike down there. Laura Lip, where the Supports what it laid on, track what it came right across diagonally to the other abutment over there. And looking back, it is an old rail bed. No rails, which I wasn't expecting there to be. But it doesn't mean that there isn't more things hiding if you just know where to look. I'm not going to follow this too far back, but now it's a little sinkhole here. If I do sound out of breath, it's because climbing that snowy leaf covered embankment was a bit of a struggle. Uh, this may have led us to another, yeah, another bridge was here. There's the support column right there. So this one spanned all the way across the river. Must have been the other one that we referenced on that page that we saw a picture of. Yeah, there's more going on here. This is gonna constitute a return trip just to document this section of line. There's some foundations and some supports down there. May even be more on the other side of the river, but this big support column or pier, whatever you want to call it, is standing here where the line went right across in that direction across the river. I had no idea all this was still back here, or I should say that it was back here. Even more surprising, it's still back here. Yeah, this could be uh, 
something to trace in the future, both this direction and the other direction. But I do need to get back. My bike is down there and I don't anticipate anyone to come here today, but I'm glad I found this. This is pretty awesome. I actually found some more stuff as well. So we're looking at the other side that we didn't go up on top of, but down here across the other side, some big blocks here. And these were cut by man. And I had confirmation of that because there is some steel coming out of them right there. This laying here, I don't know if this is their original placement or they were pushed here or used for a structure. Regardless though, they are here. Looks like maybe a, a post of sorts that's rectangle shaped right there. So this area's got uh, quite a bit going on. I'm really intrigued to see what could possibly be down there, but 100% I'm returning to explore the area where that column and support pier is going towards the river. The only thing I do appreciate about this bike is that with the large battery capacity, they allow you to utilize it for your own personal use. Got a USB port coming out the side of the screen here. I'm able to charge my phone up on the fly, especially in these colder days where that typically eats your battery. Got a wall here on the left. Looks like just a large retaining wall. No rail line coming across that one. Another mile post right here. That looks like a 36. So yes, I believe the other one was 37. Arms in. And we've gone 2.1 miles so far. I haven't made a whole lot of progress. I'm getting distracted and finding these little things worth checking out. That's what the journey's about. Oh, what the hell did I just find now? Uh, there's something over here in the woods. All right, like I just said, Getting distracted, too many findings, and I just found something else. Stay put. I definitely am doing this the right time of year. Now that everything's visible with the foliage down, what I just discovered here, I probably wouldn't have been able to see during the summer months. And this may have a relation to what we learned about in that placard. I'm gonna show you in just a second. I want to show you what's in the background that's leading me to that belief. Across the river here, you see the dark and white. Well, that's comb piles, big coal banks with snow patches on them. So that's all coal workings. But look at what's right here. A number of columns. You know, this looks like at first glance. And I'm really just kind of throwing it out there only because I've seen it before. Like a coal tipple was here. And a tipple is basically like a giant hopper where they bring up the load of coal cars, dump it in, and it goes down gravity chutes, sometimes into awaiting trucks or a conveyor. But I have seen coal tipples that have foundations like this. And just as you can see, they are taller than me. There is anchor rods protruding out of the top. This one's actually worn and weathered. You see the rebar on the inside, anchor bolt on top, so something was anchored. And they're in various states of conditions. Some are holding up really well. Some are really worn down pretty badly. And let's see, there's, so that's different from the other ones. So we got three, six, Nine, 10, there's 12 of them. I could be completely off, but it is something related to coal. I do know that because like I said, coal banks are there, rail trail right there, the former rail line is there. We're near the river, so that's my first guess, but you're also open to leave your suggestions down below. But again, we found this because of the right time of year. Only two miles in. 
and we're fighting quite a bit. This isn't worth returning to, but it definitely ties the whole area together. The unfortunate thing is that today, since we're middle of December, it's one of the shortest days of the year. It's gonna get dark around four o'clock. So I need to be vigilant of the time, even though it's actually warming up as we go and I'm having a great time, but it's gonna get cold again once the temperature, once the sun goes down, the temperature is gonna drop. So I don't wanna come back in the dark if I don't have to. And I don't wanna show each and every little thing, but I also don't wanna pass up things either. So I'm just gonna have to gamble and hope for the best. And regardless, I'm gonna make the best of it. So let's see what else we'll find down the trail. And that is really bright with the sun and the snow. God, oh yeah. <laughs> I have sunglasses. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. It's still here. I saw this on Google Maps prior to coming here and there's an old abandoned train bridge. Wow. This trail is a gold mine of history. Holy crap. We may be able to cross it too. Looks like another trailhead section. Let's uh, pull over here. Yeah, I think we could cross it. Oh, this is getting better and better. I'll be right back. Stay. So there is a gate here. It's not posted saying no trespassing. There are some bars preventing anyone from riding across it. And I can see that someone's been here already. It's not very high. So I do feel comfortable at least going out onto it. It is of course icy. Rails are gone, but you can still tell. You know what? Maybe this... Was this a rail bridge? I'm, uh, I'm having some doubts. I'm seeing a lot of planking of wood across it. But I'm thinking maybe they put that here and they were utilizing this as a road bridge, either for ATVs or for vehicles. But yeah, I do think this was an old rail bridge. It goes... The joins right up to the rail trail, but I, not 100% certain. I will do some research during editing and I will put the information on the screen. If I could get confirmation that this was indeed a rail bridge, but that's what it appears to be. And it looks like in later use they did use it for road access. Now it looks like a road going back there, but again, it could have been a rail line. And I also, now let's cross over there and look. I do see some other things that have my curiosity peaked. I need to be careful here though this is the worst section of it it is rotted and the river is flowing beneath us although it's not significantly high we're about maybe 10 feet above the water it is frigid water there's some rusty nails so uh yeah i'm gonna be careful with this a little bit nervous not gonna lie I don't know if there's any holes in this wood or how thin it is. The snow creaking is what's getting me the most. Uh, it should be okay now.
Made it across, but being covered in snow and ice didn't help. But we're across. I wanted to cross it because looking at the landscape here, it's elevated on both sides. From a distance, I thought maybe that was another rail line. This is all old coal workings. And this road keeps going back. On the side of it here, we do have a retaining wall made out of ties, almost like cribbing. And here we are. Looking into the sun, so it's not the best view, but it is steel beams. And I think it's wood supports on concrete bases in the water. That's what it looks like from here. So I was right. This is all wood. Giant timbers with the big metal beam sitting on top of it. And it's all ties on top. So three different construction elements. Concrete, support base, wooden, upper supports, and then steel beams with a wooden deck. And that's looking through. And they did construct, obviously, these blockers here with this plating on the edge to catch material like it has here during high water days so it doesn't slam right into the supports. This is a deflector so it'll either push it off to one side or the other or just stop it in place. Pretty unique bridge. Here's the better view. That's a nice little find. I did see this on Google Maps, really close to the trail. I wasn't certain it would still be here because as we know, those images are often a couple years old, if not a few years old. But we're able to cross it, document it, and hopefully learn a little bit more about it. And so far, this trail is really well manicured. I mean, it's not overgrown. Granted, we're in the off season here, but still, I mean, the trail is wide. It's finally packed down gravel and dirt, like cinders. There's, you know, trash receptacles, seating. And this is a really small rock cut area that we're going through. And like I mentioned, we're going through some remote areas and there's gonna be areas where we're not gonna be close to civilization or even, even roads. But then back there at those gates, we're not too far away. So it's gonna be a intermingling remoteness and just the stones throw away from civilization. A little bit further down, came upon another placard and this one is also interesting. So not only does it have some photos, D&H Camelback Steam Locomotive and Tender right there, number 803. There's some history related to mining here as well. Right down there. It says, Stand Pipe Outfall. Notice the rusty pipe in the steam stream bed. It discharges cold water from a closed mine. It's known as... The Standpipe Outfall is a source of acid mine drainage, AMD, into the Lackawanna River. The pipe was installed by the DNH Railroad when they drilled an artesian well to provide water for the steam engines. It happened to reach into the mine water pool. Standpipes are used to fill the tender tanks of steam locomotives with water. Coal was burned as fuel. Water is heated to produce steam. What you see is the remaining base of the standpipe. There are five acid mine drainage outfalls in the upper Lackawanna River. For the entire Lackawanna River, there are three large outfalls and 11 lesser outfalls. The standpipe is considered a lesser outfall. And the outfalls are monitored on a regular basis for the amount of flow and water quality. 
Typical standpipe located on the East Broad Top Railroad, Orbisonia, Pennsylvania. So it's basically a foundation with a pipe and another pipe coming down that they could lower down. Similar, similar to what you'd see on a, a water tower. They'd have a pipe like that too that pulls down to fill the steam locomotive. And there's the Vanling, Standpipe, Gray Slope, Beaver, and Browndale Outfalls. And they're all located in a really small designated area. And that is right there. There is water coming out of it. And we'll get down there and get a closer look at it. Right up there is where we came from. And looking, there's a culvert going underneath the old DNH line. Made out of stones. And the base of it is stained orange, which is not surprising since this is AMD. I even do see a railroad track. Actually, a few of them used as supports. I'm not going to get down there and get in the water just because it is contaminated water. But they did construct this to flow into the river but this is the outflow pipe and it does have the sulfur rotten egg smell which is traditionally found with acidic mine water AMD that's why it's stained orange like rust but yes there would have been a pipe coming up and then that other arm pipe that lowered down to fill the locomotives but this is down probably a good distance they thought they were tapping into spring water and they reached the mine pool. Yeah, there's actually some more going on in this area too. They may have to return here as well. I do see some stone walls, possibly foundations, some man-made piles, which all flows down or channels down directly to this. This is pretty awesome. Not only that's still here, but they at least educated you about it as well because a lot of people who aren't familiar with mining history and other things of the sorts wouldn't really know what they're looking at. This is also similar to the one in Centralia, except it's not a pipe coming out, it's just a hole and it's like a geyser. The Centralia, Centralia geyser where that is mine water that flows out Pretty much like a geyser, that's why it's called that. See the strapping around this too? Yeah, it's nasty water. Although it does look clear, it is stained orange for a reason. It does not smell good. Just to show you too that this stuff comes off pretty easy. Just got a stick here. And it instantly turns orange. So just imagine what that will do to your clothes, your skin. I say it's nasty stuff. Oh, uh, that was oh, that was a bad idea. <laughs> that stinks. Like I said, I'm not making a whole lot of progress. This day is going by much slower than anticipated because I honestly had no idea there was this much out here. And I'm not one to really pass by things that are significantly historical, whether it's railroad related, mining related, or something of the sorts. I mean, uh, this is like a, a gold mine of a rail trail. Probably one of the most lucrative as far as findings go. And we're only about three miles in. <laughs> I can only imagine what's going to be further down the line. I'm going to run out of daylight. I'm going to have to cut my journey short at some point. And I don't know where that's going to be. But I'll worry about that later. Time to make some real progress. I'm going to cover some ground. And I don't think I'd ever say this, but hopefully I don't find anything for a little bit of time. Oh, I think there's another placard up here. <laughs> Normally I'm like, yeah, I want to find as much as I can. But this is just slowing me down so much. Oh, uh, okay, let's see what this one says. Another freaking bridge abutment. This area has too much to offer, Jesus. <laughs> so this one, more DNH rail trail history. Talking about bridge abutments. This one's a bit lengthier. I'm not going to read it all to you. I will put it on the screen. You're welcome to pause it to read it for yourself. Basically says though the wall of stone blocks was once supported a narrow gauge railroad bridge that spanned both the Lackawanna River and Jefferson Branch of the Erie Railroad. And across the river can be seen sections of the other bridge abutment now falling into the river. 
And there's a Mindoro number 29 locomotive. Used to pull coal cars from the mines. Breaker Boys. And other interesting history. Yeah, they're right. The old abutment's still here. And it is slowly falling into the river. So it's a, basically a, a heaping mound of coal material. The wall's right there, but it would have came across further and is no more. But I do see a leveled out road over there, which is probably the old rail bed itself. And I'm also wondering what's up there. All right, I guess I'll go check. I'll be right back again. Stay there. So far he's been listening. At the very least, if you're having fun today and enjoying this unknown destination journey and some of my silly humor, let me know by giving the video a thumbs up. I'd greatly appreciate it. Okay, we're on top. Some posts coming out. You can see uh, the lower lip. It went right across there. It looks like it was going down at a slope. It may have been gravity fed. I don't think the rail line was there. I think it went behind that, which would make more sense. There is an old narrow gauge rail line. Nothing left at first glance, but not to say that there's nothing hiding back there. So I'm definitely coming back in the future to explore that rail bed and those supports that we saw by the river earlier, the first ab abutment wall. But this one, I don't know. Do you think it's worth returning for? Narrow gauge rail probably didn't go all that far. Well, only was working in the mining area of the breaker and colliery. But let me know your thoughts. Do you think it's worthy of a return to investigate this itself? I don't know if I'd be able to cross over the other side. Possibly in the warmer months. But the winter months is when you can see the most and navigate the most easily. So let me know if you think that's worthy of a return visit. If not, not a big deal. But either way, I'm returning for the other one that we came across earlier. So, like I said earlier, I'm hoping that we could cover some distance. I made it no more than a couple hundred yards and found this. I'm honestly blown away by how much is out here. In just three miles, we found enough stuff to call it wraps and say, okay, that's the video. I plan on going through multiple towns, going for a long distance ride. That's still my goal. I don't know if I'm gonna achieve it. Not the way things keep going where I'm finding what the hell is this now? Stabilization of mine refuse. I'm not going to bother clearing that all off. Something more about mining history. Like I said, it's just too much out here. It's almost overwhelming. And there's also these offshoots and off trails that who knows where they go probably to old it's probably all of the old mine land that's what it looks like from here that's all old mine working so there's probably foundations maybe some narrow gauge track old portals one thing that is for certain though is that this bike so far is a joy to ride i love this thing i'm barely using it for what it's intended for I me mean, this is a higher speed really long distance bike. I'm cruising here at eight miles an hour. I haven't even touched the battery. But I'll tell you what, the upgrades they made from the previous bike really do show. And I'll touch more on those later on. But yeah, look at it. It's all old mining ruins. I could spend a day in itself exploring that. And that's something that having an e-bike would come really come in really handy because you could cover a lot of ground. 
So who knows, you may see me back here more than once or multiple times or see some of these areas again in the future. I am already returning to this trail for something else come springtime. Some of you may know what it is, some of you may not. That requires an ultra long distance ride. I mean, going almost till the trail ends and then picking up another trail. So that's gonna be a springtime return. We're gonna have more daylight, but I will be covering this land again, this trail. But for that particular journey and adventure, I do have a destination. And I won't be showing you everything along the way. Only the things we may be missed. But that one is certainly having its own destination where today is all about the journey. You did see a post, mile 34, and it said Stillwater Dam. So I'm guessing there's a dam or a reservoir up here somewhere, which I think I remember seeing on Google when I was checking this area out. And it says trail open during construction. I guess it's an active construction zone as well. Yeah, this, this whole area on both sides of us is all old mining land. Huge coal mining operation once existed here. And this rail line went through the heart of it. Delaware and Hudson. All right, we're coming back to civilization around the sweeping bend. Do you see some homes in the distance? This may be for a city. I didn't have good service for most of this ride. It's kind of in and out. But up here should be a cell tower and I should be able to confirm where we are. My map confirmed it and the sign does as well. For a city north of Carbondale and Simpson and we are continuing north northern gateway to the anthracite region 1768 battle of the thickheads hardcore region Pennsylvania 2018 America's black diamond coal was discovered here in 1871 and first mined in 1874 at its zenith there were five breakers employing almost 2,000 people in 1924, city population was 6,000. By the time mining ended in 1943, 282 men and boys died in local mines. Many more died then and later from the diseases of coal mining, probably black lung. And that's from the Forest City Area Historical Society. So I was correct with my suspicions. This is a coal mining mecca. And this rail trail goes right through the heart of it. Another pull-off pavilion, I'm sorry, picnic area. Porta John trailhead too with uh, parking and still more signs of the coal mining past. Oh, look at this little sculpture. <laughs> this is this is Wi-Fi. Three different bicycle wheels. Does that middle one spin? Of course, I got to find out. Uh, no, it doesn't want to spin. I'm not going to force it. The little sunflowers say D and H and R T, which is D and H Rail Trail. I don't know what the Wi-Fi is for, but <laughs> something different. All right, let's continue down the trail, passing into and through Forest City. Well, this is nice. They really. Uh, are accommodating for those who are passing through on the trail. So they have a, I guess you want to call it a signpost. I don't know if there's a more proper name to it, but arrow for a bicycle pump and repair station. Green, follow the uh, trail. There's a pharmacy, groceries and water. And then if we come over here, Bottom one says Stillwater Dam, which we haven't arrived at yet. New York border, 34 miles, not that far away. Spectacular views in both directions. Lackawanna River of the Year, which we just passed. Oh yeah, free Wi-Fi. 0.3 miles where we just came from. Now that makes sense. Now let's see what the other side states. 
ATM shopping, food, follow the bike, arts, and antiques. That's really nice. Really helpful for people who are not familiar with the area. So if you come to Forest City, you can get food, supplies, fix up your bike, do a little shopping with antiques. And along the way, spectacular views. A bit further down the trail now, we are at uh, 6.2 miles. And just want to show you that this business is being smart. Advertising food and beer along the trail. For simpler times, friends, food, spirits, simple. Located in Forest City, which I believe we just passed by the road leading to it, which I didn't show on camera, but I think it's pretty clever to advertise along the trail. If you want food or beer or both, you're not far away. We had a quick stop here on this bridge. The new, new portion of the bridge. This one still has the old portion. Here you can see where the trains would have crossed. Was a double bridge at one time. You can see the elevation's a little bit higher than what this one is right now. And look straight ahead, past the bridge. A dark, cavernous area. That is a really large culvert going underneath the roadway. Not sure how far it goes, but maybe something to return to in the future. It may only go 100 feet to the other side. May go further. Come over here a little closer. Can't see all that great through the trees, but that's probably uh, at least 12 to 15 feet high, that culvert, and it's uh, an arch. It's not a complete circle. Who knows? Maybe I'll investigate it one day. 7.5 miles in. I'm not for certain, but I think we may have come upon the outskirts of the dam. There is a structure there with a gate down in front of it. But it's something there along the edge of the water. But up here, it does look like it kind of pulls up a bit. I don't know, maybe I'm just early, early speculating, but it looks like something you would see at a dam. It could have been dismantled. Another thing I could point out too is that it's significantly colder up here. There's not only more snow, but it was getting warmer. Once I passed through Forest City, it got colder. I could feel a, a chill in my body right now, so I had to strip off some layers earlier. I think I got to put them back on. Even though it's warming up today, the farther north we're going, it doesn't warm up all that much. It may not even break the 40s up here. We're on another remote section of the trail. No civilization around. No signs of anything. Just the trail. Nature. And the occasional squirrel and chipmunk. I stand corrected. There's the dam right there. So what we saw earlier, I had no idea what that was. But this is 100% the dam reservoir. The water is down. And the spillway is completely exposed. Don't think there's access over there. I don't think it's public. Although there is a little road here. But there's a fence blocking access to it. But we found it. Saw the signs for it. So far, this trail, the DNH trail, is phenomenal. I am loving what it has to offer in more ways than one. Not only is it a really well manicured trail with numerous areas to pull over, take a break, have lunch, even the bike repair station, you go through different towns. And there's a lot of things to see along the way. And that was purpose number one. But purpose number two was to see how this bike performs. And the bike is a muddy, dirty mess right now. As mentioned, this trail is really softening up and getting wet and mushy and muddy from the melting snow. So the bike and my backpack is covered in a layer of material. But I do want to take some time here just to talk a bit about this bike because... As mentioned, this is the second reason I came out here today to put this bike to the test. So this is the Anioki 
A8 Pro Max. And this is the second bike I'm reviewing by Anioki. The first one was the AQ177 Pro Max. Now that bike was a great bike. I did a 74 mile long distance ride on it, going from Pittston to Berwick and back. But this, the A8, is their updated, upgraded version. It has a few improvements they made on it. So, number one, a lot of people complain about the AQ177 was the front suspension. It didn't do a whole lot. Anything more than just a little tiny bounce, it really, you, know, you felt it through the handlebars. The suspension has been greatly improved. Not only that, we do have a larger, more powerful motor. And another thing that we noticed on that review video that I did is because we had a really hard time seeing the screen. So this screen is bigger and brighter. It's actually one of the larger screens I've had on an e-bike. And lastly, they've lightened the bike. The AQ177 Pro Max weighed 112 pounds. This weighs 101 pounds. It's 11 pounds lighter. It's still something. The battery itself, though, still massive. It's a 33-pound battery. And, well, actually, actually, one more difference. The AQ177 had an NFC card that you tapped on the screen to activate the bike. This does not have that. This has this. A remote control. Watch this. Yes, you activate and power on the bike using the remote. And there it is. You can actually see the screen now in daytime. Although with my own two eyes, it is much brighter. It's a color screen. It does have your battery, odometer, which you can obviously circle, uh, cycle through for trip, max speed, average speed, pedal assist mode, and the icon up there is showing that I'm using the USB port right now. I'm charging my Osmo Action 3 battery pack. My phone got fully charged. Now I'm charging my batteries. Now this bottle holder and this phone mount did not come with the bike. These are my own, and I will put links in the description if you want to check them out for yourself. But these are great additions for something like this. You can keep your phone right here where you need to see it. And the bottle holder does clamp on. It's rigid. It's actually designed for motorcycles, so it can actually handle high speeds. It's got a little netted pouch on the side as well. So those are the differences, but let's talk more about specific specifications and features. So this does have an estimated top speed of 28 miles an hour, which I have not confirmed that yet. If I do find a dry, smooth section of trail, we'll see how fast it goes. The AQ177, I believe, went over 30. This will probably do the same. But we do have front and rear suspension. Do have the heavy-duty cargo rack. This does not have the rear seat, but it might be optional. But I'm going to be putting an extra-large cargo rack. The seat is also bigger. They call this seat like a sofa on their website, which is kind of funny, but it's like a big armrest. I mean, it's a big seat. I will say it's a bit stiffer than the one on the AQ177, but it's longer and just as wide. So you have plenty of, as you can see, landscape to sit on, whether you want to sit further up, further back, but it's a big oversized seat. It is not a step through design, it's a step over. So that's a little bit different variation as well. Do have a working tail light slash brake light and a big bright headlight right there. On the control pad here, do have a few different buttons. So the power button in the middle is a dummy button. It doesn't do anything. That's because this works off the remote. I is info. You could cycle through your different displays. Plus and minus for pedal assist. It does have five pedal assist modes. Dedicated headlight button and a walking mode. So if you hold down the minus button and you want to push the bike, it will assist with the motor. So you're not pushing just the pure weight of the bike. So it does have walking mode. Another great feature, and this is actually explained in the full color manual. If you long press plus and minus, it will take you to the sub menu. You have P settings. And the one P setting on here will take you to your pedal assist mode, zero through five. So you hit I, zero through five starts blinking, and then 
you can actually customize the output for each pedal assist mode. So right now, pedal assist one, 28%, pedal assist two, 40%, three, 58%, four, 73%, but if you wanna adjust it, you just go plus and minus. And five is at 97%. So you can customize the output of each of the five pedal assist modes and the manual does explain that. So that's a great feature. You can also customize other settings too, like top speed. And if you do change the wheel size, stuff like that. Now this does ride on 20 by four inch wide fat tires. Stopping power is hydraulic disc brakes. It does come standard with front and rear fenders. Of course the rack, as I mentioned. Powering this is a massive 52 volt, 60 amp hour battery, which powers a 1000 watt, 1400 watt peak rear hub motor as mentioned the bike does weigh 100 pounds the battery itself weighs 33 pounds it does have a 350 pound payload so it can handle heavier riders or heavier gear that you're carrying handlebars are not adjustable but they they are in a comfortable position electronic horn seven speed shimano gear system half twist throttle and that's one thing i don't like about this the aq177 did have a full twist throttle. For a bike like this with the long range that it gets, I would want to see a full twist throttle. It's much more comfortable. Half twist, not a deal breaker, but that's just my personal preference. And the range, the range is basically the same as the AQ177 Pro. 130 miles on throttle only, 220 miles plus on pedal assist. I forgot to mention, there's a few other features with this remote and the bike so as we saw double pressing the middle button does turn it on now if you hit the unlock button you'll see it actually turns it off you get the confirmation signal and it is turned off now right now it's just off and unlocked but if you hit the lock button the bike is now armed which means But now, if you hit the lock button, the bike is now armed, which means if someone tries to move it or take it, you're gonna get a, a warning alert, and then if they continue to fumble with it, the alarm does go off. I'm gonna demonstrate that for you right now. So, there's the warning. There's the alarm. There's the uh, unlock it to turn the alarm off. So if someone does try to walk away with your bike, it does sound an audible alert. And it's pretty loud. It's gonna get the attention of people around it. Now I do have some mixed feelings on this. I do think it's a clever design and kind of a cool little thing to show off. Like, hey, I could arm my bike, power it on with this. So if you don't have this remote or if you forget to bring this with you, you're SOL. You can't turn on the bike without these remotes. The other thing too is that when you do turn it on, like right now, it beeps. So it's still gonna get people's attention even if you don't want it to. There's no way to disarm or disable that beep. I even confirmed it with Anioki. It is designed that way. So every time you turn on, turn off, lock, unlock the bike, it makes an audible beep. So that is something to be aware of. There is an alternate setup though that you can get through Anioki, and that is the same setup as the AQ177 Pro Max of the NFC key card, where you just tap the screen, that powers on the bike. So that is an option that's available. But this does come standard with the remote, with the alarm system built in. So if you do chain up your bike, which I do, I do have a chain, and someone is still fumbling with it, they're gonna get discouraged to keep trying to get your bike with that alarm going off. So I do think the pros do outweigh the cons, but it is something to, just to keep in mind if you do get this bike. If you do wanna get the battery out too, right there. And it lifts out, gigantic battery. There's the battery tray, it weighs 33 pounds. And it does beep, confirming it does have contact back in the battery tray. 
Now, when I made my review videos of the AQ177 Pro Max, there were a lot of doubters in the comments section saying it won't even do 50 miles, it won't go 80 miles, it won't do this, won't do that. I've proven that it will. I did a 74 mile ride and didn't even put a dent in the battery. It's a comfortable ride, it's a long distance ride. And when I say that this is an alternate mode of transportation, it is because it's something you can use on a regular basis to get wherever you're going if the weather's adequate, depending on where you live. If you live down south where it's warm year round, you can ride this as much as you want. Up here, Pennsylvania, obviously you're gonna get about nine, 10 months of the year at most to ride this. It won't replace your car, but it will help with some expenses on your car. If you're driving this and not driving your car as much, you're not gonna to have to do oil changes often. You won't be racking up the mileage on your car. You won't have to be putting in gas as often. And if you do have a solar power setup or a power station, portable power station, you could charge the bike off of, this, off of that and not even pay a dime for electricity to charge this. Or you could charge the battery in your car as you're driving if you have a power converter. There's different ways around it depending on how intricate you want to get. But essentially, you can save money with your vehicle by riding this more and you can charge this for free if you have the right equipment. So it's not gonna be something you're gonna take the family on a vacation on. You're not gonna go do a grocery shopping list on it. But if you need to run to the grocery store and get a couple things and you have saddlebags or a crate, not a, not a big deal. If you wanna go out and have an all day adventure, this is gonna take you there. On this particular trail, which goes through multiple cities and towns, a bike like this is what's intended for. You're gonna go to and back and still have battery left. I have no doubts that this will go a long range. But as I always say, I'll continue to say, the range is dependent on the rider's size, which means if you're lighter, you'll go further. If you're heavier, have a lot of gear, you're not gonna go as far. The terrain, if it's mostly flat, you're gonna go further. If you're climbing a lot of hills, it's gonna wear down the battery faster. If you're doing throttle only, you're only gonna get a certain amount of range compared to if you're pedaling on pedal assist. So those are the factors to keep in mind. With that being said, I think the upgrades are great. It's fantastic. I did like the step through design better of the AQ177 and the full throttle, full twist throttle, but everything else on this bike is better in all ways. So thank you to Annie Oki for reaching out to me to work with them again and to showcase their second, better upgraded product, the A8 Pro Max. If you would like to get more details or the latest pricing, there will be links down below in the description as well as links to other e-bike reviews and of course links to my Annie Oki AQ177 Pro Max reviews if you want to compare. With that being said, I'm going to have a little snack, get some thicker gloves back on because it's still colder here and continue and there's people coming don't know where we're stopping at that's to be determined but the journey does not stop here crossing over the road dnh rail trail uniondale well, this person has some interesting yard decorations oh i gotta stop and check this out i see some trains Holy crap, I thought there was a dog in that doghouse right there watching me. It's a fake one. Must be someone who loves trains or either that or worked for the railroad. They got a few different toy trains out here, G scale. One sitting right there and a few over here. <laughs> That's actually a lion in there. I thought that was a dog inside the doghouse. It really got me. Yeah, various train things, painted tires, painted rocks. Kind of cool. They have it out here for those to admire coming down the rail trail. Now the trail has changed here. It's no longer the, <clears throat> excuse me, packed gravel surface. Either that or I'm on the wrong side of it. I don't know. I guess you could be on either side. But it's more or less just a uh, grass road with some 
worn down sections of tire tracks or walking tracks but yeah this is how it is for now going through Uniondale looks like there might be a firehouse up there I do see a siren and going through right through people's backyards so change of scenery change of trail something to point out as we continue and we are almost 14 miles into our journey trail of the year 2021 dna trail trail i believe that so at this stopping area there's another bike station bike rack and a caboose the dnh number 35708 built in 1942 and it looks like uh, weight is 46,000 pounds. That would be, let's see, about 23 tons. I think they may even have some gatherings here or get togethers, events. There's a whistle marker right there. So there must have been a crossing somewhere nearby. Could have been for, it's probably too close for that. Maybe one further up. But they even have some information as to how they brought this here. It says Pusher Caboose, War Baby, built in 1942. Caboose in service around mid-1980s with plywood siding. So this is it right here. In operation, in service up until the 80s. Tongue and groove fur flooring and siding. Caboose was restored to its original siding. Stencil to the lower left is the weight, 46,000 pounds or 23 tons. Heavily rugged caboose due to its steel underframe. Caboose condition in 2016 as it sits on a siding in Carbondale. Wow. They really brought that back from the dead. Fully refurbished. And it was brought back here. Three engines pushing against the caboose heading north upgrade near Stillwater Dam. Man, rail history here is fantastic. Got a crane lifting it up. And there's the inside of it, which was like their sleeping quarters slash office. I mean, you can really read all this if you come here for yourself. Even foundations for a water-powered business nearby. Okay, this restored caboose sits exactly where the boxcar is sitting in this photo, which is right there. It is a siding to the Uniondale Grist Mill. Note the size of the mill, which is located directly behind the Gables, Cables General Store. Part of the Grist Mill Foundation is still intact behind the caboose. So it looks like there was a bridge here, a waterfall, the building, the caboose, which is now the, I'm sorry, the boxcar, which is now the caboose. All right, well, ooh, Uniondale Tunnel. This stream that runs out of Lewis Lake runs through Uniondale under the railroad. Where is that at? Wow. <laughs> Just hit another little pocket of history here. Let's see. There's even more early history of Uniondale. Incorporated as a borough in 1855. But yeah, there's... Oh, maybe the tunnel's right down here. Boy, it's out in the Union Dales. Coming, coming hard. A lot of history here. Looks like these steps were newly added too. Maybe they're going to offer tours of this or have a type of museum on the inside. It's great to see it's been saved. No trespassing or climbing or playing on or around the caboose. Darn it. So I think the tunnel goes under, that's a gas fire pit. Just noticed that. Wow, that's a ways down there. Yep, Uniondale Tunnel, right down there. There's the waterfall. There's the stone bridge, everything's here. 
minus the foundations, which could be part of this right here. This is a stone wall. And that, yeah, that tunnel goes under the rail line. And a gorgeous waterfall. Hard to see from here. But it's all here. History is still existing. Could definitely do a video just of this town by itself. Checking out all the ruins, learning the ins and outs of the history. But that's for another day. There's an old sign here too, related to the railroad days. Could have been, could have said yard limit on it. Could have been crossing, could have been anything. And here is the W for whistle for a nearby crossing. But even along this here, they have benches and seating. So Cable's General Store, established 1910, is somewhere over there. So that's the place you can stop and check it out if you wanted to. Oh yeah, there's some views here. I can see why they have the seating. Wow. Water's really rushing too. And wide angle camera's not doing it justice, but it's coming under the stone bridge up there. It's our stone arch bridge. Water's flowing through it, coming down over that waterfall there, which is probably about 10 to 12 feet high, and then flows underneath through the Uniondale Tunnel, as it's called, and expels somewhere on the other side. So, who knows? Maybe, oh, I do see some old foundations down there. Yep, there's, there's stuff down there. Yep, that's what's down there. I saw that from up on top of the trail. That's still there, and probably some more stuff. Mill burned down in a fire in 1958. Also got to the post office and did extensive damage to cable store, but that's still here. Yeah, that's what we saw. That's still there. The waterfall. This building's gone, but these are still there, so. I like to try to find that too. Old turning and lumber mill still stands along the stream. It was known for its wooden tool handles. The concrete piers are from an old garage auto dealer that once spanned the creek. So that may be upstream further on the other side of the bridge. So I confirmed it. I will be back here in the warmer months to Uniondale, whether by vehicle or by bike and getting down there in that water source. Checking out the Stone Arch Bridge, going through the Uniondale Tunnel, checking out the remnants of that water mill. And who knows what else we might find. But yes, this is added to the list. I will be back here. But as much as I want to stay and keep exploring, I want to keep going. There's a better view. Came over on the road. There is the Uniondale Tunnel that flows beneath the D&H Trail. And over here by this barking dog, I did find the remnants of those supports as well. Man, look at that. Stone, rail, concrete. And so there was an automotive garage that was here. And there's part of a, I think the mill as well. Some old ruins and foundations back there. There's certainly a lot to see here. Wow. Oh, what's the matter? Want some treats? So do I, I don't have any for you though. Definitely a lot more snow the further north we're going. This is the Herrick Trailhead. I'm guessing that's the town of Herrick. Although I'd never heard of it. I surprisingly have service here. Yeah, Herrick Township. 
And we continue north. We should be then, if we keep going, it'll be a rat. A R A R A T. This is essentially a snow covered trail right now. It's more snow than not. And I'm cruising 12 miles an hour comfortably. Oh, I see a sign. There's food up ahead. I love that they had that along the trail. Just let you know what's coming up. Food, bike repairs, general stores. A lot of other trails you know, that go through towns, there's no signage letting you know if there's anything nearby. I wouldn't mind in the future stopping at some of these establishments to either check out what they have to offer as far as like the general store or getting something to eat. Especially that one that had the sign for beer and food by Forest City. Just for the fact that they put that signage out on the trail. I think they deserve to earn some business. I am noticing too that back this way, there's a lot more sections of the trail are posted on both sides with either signage or purple paint. So like the earlier part of it, there's kind of free rain. You're able to get off the trail if you wanted to. Back here, it is people's property. I think what my plan is going to be is I'm going to ride until I reach the next town. Wherever I find like a grouping of homes or businesses or something. And I think it's going to be my stopping point. Because I know that on the way back, I'm going to get back quicker because I won't be stopping at all the things that we found along the way. I'll be able to just keep riding. So I think I'll be able to get back in a safe amount of time and still have enough light. And if the sun goes down, it won't be too far after it's down when I get back. So I feel more confident pushing ahead a bit further, knowing that going back, even though it's a slow go, it's going to be a primarily a direct shot. I actually just stopped and talked to a person who lives here. He's coming down his driveway. This trail actually goes right across his driveway. He lives on several acres out here. And he asked me if I saw any wildlife. I'm like, oh, just a couple of squirrels and chipmunks. He's like, well, just recently we saw a mama bear and three cubs. I said probably about 350 pound bear. And uh, he said it's had a gigantic buck chasing a doe. He said, there's tons of wildlife out here. He said, he heard a pack of coyotes the other night howling. But he said, yeah, he's like, just be vigilant. You know, they're out here getting the last of the food before winter sets in. I'm like, well, thankfully, I always carry protection with me. He's like, smart man. I definitely wouldn't come out here. Even though there's no people out here, you don't know what you could run into with wildlife. So not that I ever, not that I ever want to have to use my protection. I feel better having it. But yeah, to see a... A bear and three cubs wouldn't be my first encounter. I did see that before. But out here, where they're scavenging for food before the winter, might be a different story. And I can't really go all that fast on these trails, so. This is really desolate out here. It's just old dirt farm roads. <laughs> He did state there was a gas station when I reached the main road about a mile away. They have food there and stuff, so that's a good thing to know. And I said, man, you got the life out here. You're living out here, you know, kind of by yourself. No neighbors, no people. He's like, yeah, one neighbor is about 50 acres away. The other neighbor is about 20 acres away. I'm like, man. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I'm not hating it. I said, I don't blame you. I mean, you're far away from things, but at the same thing, you're at peace and quiet and and now this trail is completely snow covered. Yeah, I don't know how much farther I'm going. There's a couple inches of snow out here now. And as mentioned, the further north, north we go, the colder it's getting. So I am a little bit chilly, not freezing. I'm better than I was on the rail trail, the bike train I did with Randy, Jake, and Becky. I was cold to the bone there. Here it's just on the border of being cold and comfortable. 
Oh well. Wouldn't be a journey and adventure if you didn't come across some highs and lows, right? It's a winter wonderland out here. Nothing but snow. I had to pop in the hand warmers. My hands were getting really cold. And uh, bike's still doing good. One thing I'm noticing though is out here, it's semi-remote in areas, but there's not a whole lot out here as far as ruins remains. There's the occasional stone wall, occasional concrete support for like a signal or a battery box, but nothing substantial like we found earlier. Most of the stuff that we found was in the first three miles. We obviously found stuff afterwards, like you know, in Forest City and Uniondale, but out here, at least in this section, not a whole lot. But this trail goes on for a long distance, so I'm confident that, you know, even if we don't see more before Ararat, that when I do return to the future to continue to my destination, we're going to come across more things. It's not a bad thing, though. I mean, it's more wilderness. There's the occasional farm and homestead. A lot of acreage out here. And we're going to be coming across Fiddle Lake Road. It's like another trailhead up here too. So if you are charting your progress with me, Fiddle Lake Road is where we are right now. I don't even know what town this is. Yeah, I'd say we're in the farm part of the area. Countryside. Cobb's Greenhouse. This is Farm Road. Just taking the landscape though. And just to think how long ago trains came through here. And the people on board got to take in these same views. We are 21 miles in. Have not reached Ararat yet. I think I'm about a mile away. Off to the right is a lake here. I will put the name of it on the screen so you can see where I'm at. And I pulled over because I found some more ruins. There is a few different concrete bases. And I'm not the first person to be here. There's already some footprints. Oh, okay. This is similar to what I saw along the um, Lehigh Gorge Trail on Jim Thorpe, where there's a concrete box like this and hollow on the inside. This could have been a battery box for the signal, but... It looks larger than the usual ones, and I don't think we're nearby a crossing. That's where these typically are located. To power the signal near a crossing. So I don't think that's what it is. Other things too, there's um, a base here with a steel plate on it. But there's some piping here as well. I wonder if this was maybe an old filling station. So that pipe, the cap on it does say water. And coming closer to the edge here... There's like a, I don't know if it's like a borehole or something coming up. It's plugged up, but this cast iron pipe is coming out, out of the ground. And we do have these concrete bases here with little nubs coming out, as well as some more over there with some anchor bolts coming out. So, hmm. Close to the lake. I wonder if this was maybe a water tower here or a filling station for the locomotives. It's close enough to the tracks. It's got a water source. There's piping. I still don't know what that little opening is in there. Why it's hollowed out with those chambers. And then on the other side. Ooh. Okay, another concrete slab, piece of rail sticking out 
which is used for structural support, I'm guessing. And this is hollow underneath. I do have a flashlight. I can stick you guys down there and see what it looks like. Okay. Is that a TV I see? How the hell did a TV get down there? like a little empty room I don't know I mean, I'm only looking on the screen of the camera I can't see with my own two eyes but it looks like an old 90s television or early 2000s television maybe huh how the hell did they get that down there because this is capped off you got this big rock here rocks on top of it there might be an opening here yeah there's an opening there and yeah I, I don't know if this is in relation to that it's kind of caddy quarter from each other I'm about 70-30, this was a filling station here for locomotives for water. That may or may, may not have had something to do with it. Same with that. Interesting findings though, right next to this lake, along the d &H Trail. And I'll tell you what, this snow is helping keep things very cold. I'm looking on at the weather. And back in Scranton, it's in the lower 50s right now. Here, it's only in the mid 40s. And although there's no wind and it still feels nice out, the snow is just keeping like an insulated blanket of coldness on the ground. So my feet are relatively cold because I'm riding over a lot of snow, constant you know airflow going through my feet. So my feet are on the colder side. I do have the hand warmers in, so my hands are doing fine. If I have to, I'll throw them in my shoes. I may end up doing that, but once we get back down past or closer to Forest City, it will be much warmer. But up here, the cold is lingering. It's about 10 degrees colder here than where it is back in the valley by Scranton. So I'm feeling it. It's cold. Thankfully, like I said, I'm going slow. If I was going faster, I would be frozen to the bone again. But the bike, though, it is filthy. It is covered in such slop and mess because the trail is just sloppy and messy. I mean, it is just needs a good washing. But so far, it hasn't been affecting anything. The battery is still fully charged. We are at 21 miles even. Currently still charging my batteries on my camera because the cold is eating these up like crazy. I usually get a long... A long time out of each battery for this camera that I'm using, I'm getting about half the length of time because the cold is just zapping the power. So thankfully I'm able to charge on the fly. Otherwise though, other than me, you know, having to deal with the elements, the bike is performing phenomenally. Is that a word? Phenomenally? Phenomenally. My only complaint, I don't like the half twist throttle. I'm going to see if I can get it switched out for a full twist throttle. My hand is getting sore, so for long distance throttle riding, half twist because you have to, you know, keep it held and keep your hand on the grip. Your hand does get sore and wants to cramp up, so I don't like the half twist throttle. Other than that, I like everything else, and it's a comfortable ride. The suspension, the big massive sofa seat, the tires, upgraded suspension. It's working as it should, and I. Honestly, I have no complaints other than that throttle. Even in the snow, it's handling one to two inches of snow easily. Not spinning out, not sliding out. Full traction. Brakes are working as intended. The only thing I haven't done was a high speed, top speed test. I don't think it's going to happen today. It's just not the right conditions. If this trail was dry, it'd be a different story. But it is wet, sloppy, snowy, and... I'll have to save that for a different time. But if this is anything like the 
other model that they offer, this goes around 30, if not a little bit higher, 30 miles an hour. I want to press on though. I want to reach air at. And now some of you may be thinking, Jay, you said there's no destination today. That's your destination. Well, coming into this trip, this journey, I had no destination. I knew Ararat was one of the towns along the way, and I did scout this trail all the way up further north, way past Ararat. But just seeing how the conditions are, seeing how time got away from me, and that I'm not gonna be able to go as far as I'd like to, I had to make a call. And on top of that, there's not a whole lot of sun left, less than two hours, so I gotta stop talking, get back on the trail. I made it, I reached my unofficial destination, Ararat, Pennsylvania, Ararat Trailhead. And it's a cold farm area. It's the intersection of Burnwood Road and Ararat Road. That's the crossroads here. And looks like the rail trail does continue down that way through the tree line. Feels nice having the sun on me right here. It is cold up here. I don't know what the elevation change is, but we definitely rose in elevation. And we're several towns north of where we started. But my journey is not over. Although I'm stopping here, I have to go all the way back. And like I mentioned, my Relive app is still running in the background on my phone. It's going to show the total progress, total length of time, and give you a visual map of not only where we started, where we came from, or came to, but also that will show the elevation change. And they do have a little small trailhead here for parking. Port of John. And then we do have another placard. Delaware Hudson Rail Trail. Welcome to Ararat Summit. 2,040 feet. Okay, that answered my question. Ararat Station was located at the north of Ararat Road on the west side of the railroad. So that was right over there was that train station. So I will capture a picture of this. You could, like I mentioned, pause and read it for yourself. Ararat Summit was the high point of the Jefferson Branch and Erie Railroad, which opened in 1870. So I'll read over this myself. I encourage you to do the same. It'll help you learn more about this area and showing you that the Ararat Station was right there. So there was a lot more here than what's here now. And there was a Y here as well for turning the trains around. So yeah, this was another big area for train activity. A Y was situated right here and a train station, I don't know if it's either north, south, east, west. Yes, <laughs> get my bearings. So north and west. So right over here would be the train station. All right, I'm gonna get another snack, get fueled up with some water and try to make a direct shot back to Simpson. Feet are cold. But the farther south we go, the warmer it's going to get. And hopefully we don't run out of daylight. But I'm going to keep you updated if anything happens along the way. If I do find anything new or make any more discoveries, I'll bring you back aboard. Otherwise, I'm going to roll a photo montage showing you some of the things that we captured today. And I'll talk more about how things ended up with the bike and what future plans are for this trail and going into next year. So enjoy the photo montage.
Look at my bag. <laughs> That's in the spray up of the back wheel. If you can tell, the sun's going down. <clears throat> it's about 3.25 p.m. And it's cold. I uh, passed Uniondale. Haven't reached Forest City yet. I don't know how much more I have to go. I think between 7 to 10 miles, I think. It's going to be close to dark by the time I get back. Um, I have to put some layers back on. I, I'm cold. The hand warmers are in my feet. They're okay, but my hands are cold. My core is getting cold. I'm going to put my face mask covering back on. Switch to my amber, amber glasses. Get some blood flowing a little bit because uh, it's just a cold wind. I'm pedaling off and on. But yeah, it's... Uh, probably should have turned around earlier, but I didn't. I was determined to re at least reach air... Not, I was going to say error fat. Error, error rat. <laughs> My mind's going. So, just wanted to bring you up to speed where things are. My speech is already starting to slur a little bit, which happened before. So, before I do my outro and talk with you guys to kind of share things on what I mentioned earlier, I'm going to warm up in the car so I at least don't sound like a blabbering idiot. So, just passed through Forest City. We're still in the outskirts of it, heading back towards Simpson. Significantly warmer here. <laughs> it's probably five to seven degrees warmer. And there's less snow, which is obvious because it's not as cold. But we do have a nice straightaway here. The trail is starting to harden up a bit since the sun's going down, temperatures are still dropping. And I want to do a zero at the top speed test. So I'm going to put in pedal assist five. And we're going to go throttle only. Here we go. Go 20. 25. Twenty-eight. Twenty-nine. It's like twenty-nine. Not gonna break too hard because the trail is still kind of soft. But we topped out at twenty-nine miles an hour, so it is estimated to go twenty-eight. So I say that claim is true. It is accurate. It is approximately a 30 mile per hour bike. If you were a uh, lighter rider, maybe on harder terrain, it may hit 30, 31. But hitting 29, we are down one battery bar. We already put in over 37 miles. That's uh, a pretty fair speed that we just captured right there. We're not back yet, but we're not too far away. We're in the area where we stopped earlier where we checked out this bridge there's a waterfall coming out of a culvert pipe back there and I was showing you how the old bridge abutment is still here and they replaced it with a new bridge well coming across the bridge I looked off down to the right and I found the old bridge it's right there laying in a pile bunch of ties and timbers basically what that is is what we saw earlier where i showed you where the bridge was still intact i'm like oh yeah see you can see where the bridge used to be it's up a little bit higher that was closer to uniondale but they removed it to replace it with this new bridge and for whatever reason it is laying down there so i guess you could say it's kind of a piece of history just discard it down the embankment. But I did make one other discovery too. And it's right here. There's actually a trail coming down. But we have an old telegraph pole with a few insulators still hanging on. I think they're all broken. There's no intact ones, but there's some black ones 
brown ones, and some clear ones. Depending on what section of the trail I'm on, some parts are brighter and darker than others. So the sun is still going down, it hasn't set yet, but I think I'm gonna be making it back just in time for either right before the sun sets or right when it is setting. It is cold though, I will tell you that. It is in the 40s right now. So it actually hit the 50s today, just not where I was. It hit the 50s down by Scranton and parts south of here. Simpson, farther north, it didn't really get out of the mid 40s. So that combined with the snow and going a steady 10 miles an hour, it took its toll. I'm pretty cold, but I wouldn't trade it in for the least. I had an incredible adventure. Once I get back to the car, I'm going to warm up because I do want to talk with you guys a bit, not only about today's journey and about recap what we saw, what I enjoy the most, but also what's coming to an end for 2023 and plans going into 2024, some of which do include this trail. But let me get back, let me get warmed up and we'll talk for a bit. Back in Simpson, just as the sun's going down. And some more interesting information I could share with you that I found on this placard here. It says the rail yard was the main terminal for the DNH, the city's pipeline to deliver coal to the markets near and far. DNH diesel repair shops. These buildings belong to the DNH repair shops, which were built in the first quarter of the 20th century. When the DNH purchased its first two diesel locomotives in 1944, these shops took over diesel maintenance for the line. Today, the site is used by a recycling company specializing in scrap metals. So, this whole area here was at one time a rail yard. And these structures were part of the DNH Railroad. And now being utilized by a recycling company. Well, I am back. Cold dirty <laughs> the bike is filthy got to get a good cleaning tomorrow but it served me well just want to touch briefly on the bike then I want to share some more thoughts regarding today's journey and some upcoming plans into next year so for this bike and you also saw the relive app the relive app said we did 37 miles the odometer on the bike says 41.9. Now, I have to double check, but they may have the incorrect wheel size in the P settings. If that is incorrect, that would throw out the mileage. So these are 20 inch wheels. If it's marked for something different, that could explain why that's off. So it's off by about four miles roughly, but Relive App is the one I go by 37 miles. Real of app though did confirm we did go 30, sorry, 29 miles an hour as a top speed, which this did confirm as well. So the speedometer is correct, which is good to know. We went down one battery bar, and I think that's saying very good because not only was it a cold, chilly day, we started off in the lower 30s. We haven't broken the 40s at all, and I was doing probably 60-40 with throttle, 60% throttle, 40% pedaling. And on top of that, I was charging my phone and or my batteries the entire time. So, I mean, I gave it a fair workout. Didn't put a dent in the mileage, obviously, of what it could do. But I think they did correct the issue, though, with the old Antioch that I reviewed. I did 74 miles. The battery gauge didn't go down at all. We did 
close to 40 miles it went down one bar so it's probably a bit more accurate now still more than half a battery more than three quarters of a battery but the only things i don't like about it is the half twist throttle that, that's my biggest gripe because my hand just got sore from trying to keep it squeezed the whole time like twist it back full twist throttle if i could upgrade that be perfect the other thing is the seat although it's big and it is comfy after a while it did get a bit sore but i think the cold weather may have something to do with that everything else though the bike performed flawlessly i mean it went through snow mud grass dirt roads it's smooth it's reliable and it has pretty much everything that you would want on a bike and that's the other thing i want to mention this bike does retail for a decent amount of money it's not one of the cheapest ones out there it's not the most expensive but there are other bikes in this price range but i think this bike gives you the most bang for your buck if you're a person who's looking to get the most range out of an e-bike i can't recommend Anioki any more than what i've already done they are pretty much the leaders in long range e-bikes to know that their bikes can go on average around 200 miles on a full charge says a lot the only thing i reviewed close to that which is the one i reviewed recently the g-force t7 that could go up to 130 miles and that bike is only a few hundred dollars cheaper than this one so for what you pay for you're getting the most bang for your buck the most range the most features i mean it's kind of hard to go wrong you, you in this essence you do get what you pay for so anioki a8 pro max i give it a big thumbs up it's solid reliable goes the distance has all the features you need except full twist throttle so thanks once again to anioki for allowing me to review the a8 for all of you now that that's out of the way i do want to say this video with this bike is my final e-bike review video for 2023 it's also my final rail trail video for 2023 I'm not doing any more e-bike reviews until spring of 2024. So we're gonna have about a three, three and a half month gap of no more e-bike reviews or e-bike rides. I'm just taking a break. I've done enough. And those of you who do enjoy them, they will be returning, but we'll have a little bit of break between now and then. So come spring, we'll get back into some more reviews, a lot more rail trails because that's leading me to my next thing. This trail, the DNH. This thing, I can't believe I didn't get to it sooner. This trail is phenomenal. Easily my top three trails I've done so far. Especially the section from here, Simpson to Forest City, loaded, and I mean loaded, with history and findings along the way. Everything from old abutments, to supports, to that mine pipe that's uh, spewing the AMD water, to what else was there? I can't remember, there's just so much, but that section between here to Forest City, loaded. From there, Uniondale, another town that has so much history to it, especially regarding the mills. I will be returning to do that in the summer of 2024, to walk the creek bed, go through the culverts, the bridges, check the old ruins, and learn more about the history of what took place there in Uniondale. But the first abutment that we came upon where I climbed up above and behind it, we found that old support by the river. That section, and the section on the other air, really, the section going on the other side of it, I plan on walking. So that's gonna be a video sometime in 2024. It might be spring, summer, fall, winter, I don't know. So those are two things I'm gonna be returning back to on this trail. But as mentioned, I do have one major destination I'm returning to spring of 2024. We're gonna be riding this trail from here to the very end of it and beyond because there's something up there I've been meaning to document for a number of years. And I think getting there by rail trail is probably the best way to do it. And this bike is probably gonna be the bike taking me there because it's gonna be a long all day journey. It's gonna to have to be a day when there's significant daylight because we're only here at four o'clock and the sun's gone down. So. Anyways, I would love to hear your thoughts on what you thought of today's journey with no destination in mind. And our destination turned out to be Ararat. Nice little town that has some more rail history at the Y, the train station. And I just can't wait to ride this trail again. I mean, it's just 
that great. You go through small towns, there's places to stop and eat, get a beer if you want, fix your bike, have a picnic. I, I'm just, can't believe it's just not talked about more. It's like a kind of a hidden gem of rail trails. If you are still watching, which I hope you are, please do me a favor and throw a blue heart into your comment. Let's me know that you're still watching. And those of you who are maybe thinking about getting an e-bike, pull the trigger. They're a heck of a lot of fun and you get to explore places like this. Take care everyone, stay safe, safe riding, and as always, I'll see you in the next video.